Well, Kimberly, it's so great to have you here. You're, um, you know, you're, so right now you're the executive director of Oracle's Health and Human Services Industry Solutions Group. That is correct. And you work globally. Yes, I have an amazing opportunity to work with governments helping them with health and human services. So uh, you're, you're not my average member CPA type, which is what no. has been fun knowing you over the years. Absolutely. So you started with us in our new Young Professionals group, one of the founding members. Yes. One of our really big points of pride because you became the one of the youngest chairs of the Maryland Association of CPAs. Absolutely. And... Uh, the really, really big news is you're gonna you're the vice chair elect of yes. the American Institute of CPAs. That is, oh my God, it's so cool. <laughs> I'm so, excited. So you know, from our, I can I'll be always say I knew her when. I mean, you were just you volunteered as a new young professional. You helped us kickstart this whole trend in leadership for young professionals. Right. And you're walking the talk. I mean, you've moved through the organizations. You're successful out in your career. You Two twin boys. Oh, they're 10 and 12, but they act like twins. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Not, that's right. 10 that's and 12. Right. 10 Not 12. twins. They're all, yeah. So, um, so mom, you're doing it all, which, right. which is exactly why we want to talk to you about right? Because mm -hmm. this is, we're calling this the, the shift change conversation. And as we've been watching, you know, we're seeing like five major things that are shifting. Mm -hmm. So leadership, learning, technology, the workplace, and demographics. Absolutely. And you're here to talk about leadership and specifically like how is leadership changing? Now, the interesting thing is you kind of are modeling all the new ways of leadership. That is correct. But you know how the old guys and all do it too. So, how, so tell me how do you see, how has leadership changed right. in your opinion? Like what's different about like how you're leading and what you're seeing versus how things used to be, if you will. What do you think about that? Well, I think it is interesting because it's absolutely changing. I mean, we are in a time where we're working with four generations in the workplace. So as a leader, there is no one size fits all approach. And I think the traditional styles of management and leadership had people coming to work nine to five. You absolutely stayed there. If you were finished your work at three, you sat there and figured out something else to do until five. And so that's absolutely a change. The other change we have is that people want to work different models of work. So you have people who want to work at home. And so as a leader, you have to motivate your team to still put out the best productivity and work and at the same time build collaboration, cooperation, coordination across all of the work units and still allow them to grow. And so that's challenging for some of the traditional type managers because they want you to come in and punch a clock and be hourly and not realize that by the same token, one week they may get only 10 hours out of you, but the very next week they could get 100. And most people in today's work environment are comfortable understanding that that fluctuation could happen, but they want leaders that will promote and allow them to grow and help them in ways that will further their careers. That's like uh, spot on, which, but so, and how do you address those, um, plenty of CPAs to this day will say, if I can't see them, how do I know they're working? It's the value and the results. Yeah. Because I would not associate activity with results. That's a good point. People could be very busy doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they, very, can, they can make it look like they're oh, really busy, they right? Be, exactly. <laughs> but if you have a clear understanding of the activities that drive revenue, you will understand how their value contributes to that. And so you won't be clocking them on whether or not they put in 10 hours. You'll be looking to see how much revenue, how much productivity, how much time they saved. Yep. So, t so how has your volunteer experience at the MACPA, you've been involved in a lot of activities, the AICPA, how has that helped you with leadership, if at all? What's, what's been the kind of value to you? From that standpoint? Well, there's a lot of value. I mean, understanding the regulatory environment, understanding all of the different leadership styles. I think the profession has been at the forefront of looking at the different generations and looking at some of the initiatives to drive diversity. And because of those things, I've been involved on the ground level in some of those discussions. And that allows me to go into other volunteer activities I may do with my alumni institution or with my community service organization. So I'm working with the different uh, generations. I'm working on different topics, some of which I work in every single day, like technology, and some of which I may not be working in every day. Yeah. And those things together help me as a professional grow and continue to do better. 
So when you first started out, you were a young professional and you were being exposed to our board of directors, which was not very young back then. Yes. Um, since then, we've had <laughs> yes. a lot more young members come on. We've had a lot more diversity, a lot more diversity in every sense of the word, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So how was it for you in those early days? Like, were, What were the challenges, if any, that you thought about like coming in and having to work with older generations and a more kind of established professional notion? Or, well, what I found really interesting, especially as it relates to Maryland, is that the past chairs were spot on, very interested in me. They wanted to know, at that time, I was in the government. And right. so they were very interested in me as a government CPA. And then when I moved into um, public practice, they were very interested in that as well. Um, and I guess for, from their perspective, they really thought, we need you. And so I always had that feeling about the Maryland Chair, the Maryland Board of Directors. They're always looking to help the profession grow and to look across segments. And so look across geographies, look across segments, look across different socioeconomic backgrounds, and really try to help the profession move forward. So my perspective is that it was very nervous the first time you go to a CPA meeting where you don't know anyone. Yep. And I think that uh, everyone there was very welcoming. And so I had to make sure that I brought something also. And so it's an investment. And that's what I tell the new young professionals. If you don't put anything in, you really can't expect to get anything back. It's, and uh, for as, as uh, uncomfortable as you may be, people are also looking to learn about you. So they may be uncomfortable. And if you're both working together for the middle ground, then it turns out always. What well, great insight. And I love, you know, so advice for our mm -hmm. more, my generation, older generation, is that, that what you said there that I caught, right, which is they were interested in you and they yes. wanted to make you comfortable. And I think there's a big lesson for all of us, Absolutely. right, is that sometimes as leaders, we don't always think that we have to make that outreach. And yet what you're saying is that is actually the way that you bring new people in. Uh, and get them comfortable. So young professionals need to be invited to the table, which is what we've obviously learned, but that's a great piece of advice for our older generations out there. Well, leaders have to model the yeah. behavior, so it's the tone at the top, and so we can't say we have a supply concern and not do everything we can to help that supply issue. Dead on. And so when people come into the room as a leader, they're looking for you to demonstrate the art of the impossible to motivate people to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. And especially when you're leading a volunteer organization and you're not paying people. Right. So it's the motivation that you project. Right. It's the, the inspiration. the inspiration, the aspirations. You're giving them something in turn because you're believing in them. Yeah. And if you believe in them, then they think they can achieve and do anything. And you've obviously modeled that, and that's why we're so excited. You're going to be the the first chair yes. of the AICPA from the state of Maryland in yes. our 115 year history. <laughs> it's exciting. So it's it's you're making our history book big, yes. and uh, which I knew you would even when you were just getting kind of starting out. It's kind of neat. Now the other thing I think it's important is, um, and you touched on it, but you're managing a global team. This whole idea of flex work and mobile, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. Mobile, you have know, mobile devices. You can work from anywhere, anytime. Right. Um, so, what? How do you do that as a leader? Like, what advice would you give folks for how do you manage a global flex team like that? Right. And I'll tell you what's even more interesting, Tom, is that it's a matrix group. So most of us are individual contributors, and so you are looking to get people to do things that you are accountable for, without always the authority to get it done. So you're kind of managing volunteers almost. You're, exactly. you're recruiting people to help exactly. you in your cause. Traditional leadership had a very hierarchical leadership um, environment. Yep. So there was one manager, you went to them. Up they, the chain. Up the chain. And in today's environment, it's very flat. Everyone's yeah. an individual. Everyone's the boss. Everyone's in charge. They can deter they're can. they self-directed. There's no one giving them um, the job description that they applied for could be two sentences. It's not right. really that detailed. So there's, so the today's leadership environment says that people are self-directed, and if you give them the outcomes, they will move toward those in a collaborative fashion. But the whole, you will do it because I'm paying you, right. doesn't necessarily work. That's not working And especially when you're working with people from different cultures, yep. because their hours are different, their holidays are different, what they're motivated by is different. And so they may not choose to work in a way that you would have them work. Right. But if they get the work done, then the question ultimately is, does it matter? Right. So how did you, how did you adapt to that? Like, how do you, so what do you do as a leader? To, to learn about your team, to be able to get to that point where you can influence them to be that contributor that you need. 
And I'll tell you, it's very interesting because actually, and, and earlier I think I said I went from government to public practice. I went from public practice to government. Right. So the government, before coming to Oracle, was I was a CIO yep. with directs, and I could touch and see everyone every single day. And so I went from that environment to an Oracle environment where I didn't see my direct manager. Uh, IT didn't necessarily set up my computer. I did the setup of my phone. They pretty much said, Kimberly, this is what you're accountable for. Go, and make, so, it happen. go make it happen. So it's work ethic. It's discipline. It's a desire to learn. I mean, it's a desire to really work in an environment where you're working with such highly accomplished people that it makes you better. Steel sharpens steel. Right. And so when you're around other people that uh, are just as great or even better, you have no choice but to rise to the occasion. That's pretty neat. So, and you've touched on like just about everything. So the whole notion that, right, we've moved from hierarchy mm -hmm. to more of a network, right, yes. or the matrix idea. We've moved from command and control mm -hmm. to connect and collaborate. Absolutely. And then clearly the whole idea of social. You also touched on row, right, results only. So the thing is, it's not about activity. Mm -mm. It's about results. So these are, uh, it, these are some interesting points, right? This is how, so what's interesting I always think is what leadership does fundamentally hasn't changed, but how it does it is changed a lot. That is true. Right? Because we're still trying to direct people and we're still trying to accomplish big things and, and motivate and get everybody inspired. That's true. But, but how we do it is very different than it was five years or, or ten years ago. And there are still right. vestiges of the old style running around, but it's changing pretty rapidly. Well, that's because people are not committed to the job. They're committed to the leader. Yeah. And so the point. leader makes the difference. They will come to work and work 20 hours a day for the person that they walk on glass for the person that they really admire, respect, and they think have their best interest at heart, as opposed to the person who could get eight hours, you will only get eight hours. Yeah. So if you really want to get the best throughput and productivity from your employees, it means that on their birthday you may say, I want you to take the afternoon off. Yeah. Because that will pay dividends and you will get exponential results from them because they'll want to do it. Yeah. And if you can get them to want to do, I mean, in my experience, I've learned that managers manage tasks and leaders lead people. And so if that's the case, you have to appeal to their own internal sense of self. Right. And it's not necessarily telling them you're here to make me money. It's also here to improve your own skill set. Yep. That's pretty neat. You really, you really touched on a lot. Talk about the role of learning and leadership. So what, how does, how do you, you say it's steel sharp and steel. How do you keep your steel sharp and keep going from that standpoint? What's? I am constantly reading every single day. I have a Kindle. Every day I get to read. I have to keep up. My kids are 10 and 12. And sometimes I think that fifth grade math, oh my. <laughs> I think sometimes we all look at um, how the kids learn today. And we're like, okay, did they do that when I was in fifth grade? But I mean, but in any, any result, I think we have to continuously learn. I am in a rapidly changing industry, so technology changes. Yep. And even from the time that I've been at Oracle, we've acquired more than 60 different acquisitions. Oh my God. And so in my industry, I'm responsible for applying those technologies and applications to the industry business challenges and issues. So that means I have to know a lot about my industry yep. and a lot about the technology that, that will help works them. That, industry. that works with that industry. So and you're you in health and human services, which isn't changing much, is it? Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. And, and it's also just global in yeah. nature. I mean, right. you never think, for instance, homelessness. What do you do when someone shows up that's homeless at the hospital? You right. don't know what they're allergic to. And you don't know where they live and you don't have any no background to, no background how can technology help you prevent and detect fraud how can technology help you do reporting and outreach and leverage social media right. so I have to understand all those topics so every day I'm, I'm reading the newspaper I'm looking at social media I'm getting alerts on our competitors and so you have to be almost a uh, devourer yeah. all levels and aspects of technology information because that's my role, as well as just my industry. You know, it, it's funny because you're, you're touching on the whole technology point, which is obviously a driver of a lot of this. So you, you, know, you think about we see three big drivers: right. technology, globalization, mm -hmm. and demographics. Absolutely. And you're, you're, you've kind of hit all of those, and they're creating the shift change, which is, like you said, driving all this stuff. And you know, CPAs. There's been a recent study out about the, the CPA of the future. 
And there are two areas that really stuck out for me. One is CPAs don't know how to look at future trends. And you know, what you just described, I'm watching, I'm, I'm looking out for the technology trends and my industry trends, and I'm trying to combine those to find out what's, going, what's coming next. Right. So I think that's a really important thing for all leaders and for mm -hmm. all people, all, all professionals, like you said, right? And then the other one is the notion of the speed with which that, yes. that change is happening, which is just kind of, right? Unbelievable. So, yeah. So when I think about when I went to UMBC, I don't think I, I mean, I learned to type on a typewriter with a carriage. You're not that thing. old. Don't give me that. I did. No, I did. <laughs> Honest. I mean, my kids learned to type on a keyboard. Right. And so when I think about their access and opportunity with technology, oh. we didn't grow up in social media. Right. It's scary. Yeah. I'm thinking if I fell down the steps, someone would see it on social media. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. It's true. So everything is being captured in, in a very rapid way yep. and from around the world. Yeah. So we have access. So for CPAs, as CPAs, we can't afford to sit back. Right. we got to stay on top we of have this. To stay, we have to stay ahead of it. Yeah. Not just on top, and that's even more Ahead scary, I right. know, I because right. we are adding value to our clients and stakeholders. And in order to add value, we have to be ahead of where they're going. Yep. We can't just wait, because your competitor is already there. Well, and there's been a whole lot of research on that, and this gets back to leadership too, I think, but the idea that our profession has been historical focus for mm -hmm. most of its time, and we've become reactive instead of proactive. And this whole idea that you're talking about is how do we get in front of this and become to anticipate these kinds of things and be ahead of these games. And that's a huge piece, I think. Absolutely, because from a revenue perspective, when you think about adding value to your clients, when they have to figure out what they're going to do, right. if they have a trusted source, a go-to person, whether the you're going to be it, right? you're going to be it. Yeah. You're going to be at the table. Yeah. Just imagine that. That's, that's the right way to go. Now, uh, let me, so if you had to just give someone a little piece of advice about leadership, like you, your wisdom, right, for all, so what would you, you know, kind of what you put on a three by five car, what would you say? What's the, what are a couple tips that you would say, if you're going to be a leader, think about these three or four or five things, what would you say? I would say, one, you have to think about the people. You have to People care. first. People first. It's always about, I mean, I'm working on a program right now, and someone just sent me an email, and I needed her. She's critical. And she said, my husband is in the emergency room. Now, as a leader, the first thing you have to think is, I'm praying for you, yep. and I hope your husband is okay. Yep. And then the next thing you have to do is assure her that it's going to be okay. Yep. I don't want you worrying about us. Right. We're going to get it done. We got it right. We've we got, got your it. back. Now, you don't know really what you're going to do. Right. In this case, I really don't know. <laughs> but I, but as, a, as the leader, she is relieved because I took that weight from her. Yep. So it's got to be people first. And then the next thing is to align the objectives of your organization. Yep. Because we have to look at the end state, to drive revenue, right. to be productive, to get more share, to get more value and then align that with how you can motivate your people based on their skill sets. Yeah, strengths. Because you have to align Yeah. because you cannot treat a 20-year employee the same way you would someone who's a college grad. Right. But you can get both of them working toward the same objectives, yep. but just using a different mechanism to get there. Nice. So leaders have to really, it's not one side, I know it's more work, it is, right. because for one person you may say, good morning, Tom, and the next person you may say, Tom, how's it going? It's just, a, it's just a different perspective. Right. Treat your people you where they are, right? You have to meet people where they are and then make sure that you communicate frequently and directly. Yep. And so people want to know what's going on, even when you don't know. Yeah. I mean, as a leader, That's a good point. I would just say sometimes, I, guys, I don't know. Yeah. And it's okay to right. not know. That's something a lot of leaders struggle with. That's another good point. Oh, I would tell them all the time, I'm not perfect. Yeah. So if you think that I'm missing something, I need you to come and tell me you're accountable. I'm right. accountable, you're accountable. Love now, it. I don't want you to tell me in front of a room full of people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to come and tell me yep. that we are forgetting this major this client, piece, right. this piece, and come and let me know. So I want you to feel ownership and, and be a stakeholder. Nice. So you have to bring people in to the end state. Yep. Because if they think it's not about them, you will not get them on a Saturday. Because in IT, just think about it, as a CPA and I'm in IT, most of our maintenance and upgrades are on the right. weekend. Right. They really so are. So that's when your customers could be getting 
issues, right? Exactly. Yeah. So now you have to have, especially during a busy season, so think about all of your employees that are really coming in. Are you surprising them with pizza? Are you surprising them when there's a lull in the work? Just say, hey, guys, go home. Are you, you giving them some time off when you can? Yeah. There are a number of different things that we can do in order to move the profession forward. And so the other thing I would say is always make sure that you're taking into account what they want to get out of it. Yep. Because if I can figure out what's in it for you, and I know what's in it for me, and then I meet in the middle and you tell me, honestly, Kimberly, I want to be your you know, next IT director, or you yep. want to be in charge of stakeholder value management, and I tell you that, and then I say, let me help you get there. Yeah, powerful. So powerful. Because they know that if they stay there, they're not losing time. Yep. They're gaining valuable networking skills. You're putting them in public speaking environments. And I will say this, the final thing, I had a manager when I worked at NASA, and I remember doing this presentation for him, and I said, oh, I'm finished. I said, are you ready? He said, no, I'm not doing it. You're doing it. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's to the, it's to the <laughs> boss's boss. And he's like, I'll be right there. And I said, well, do you want to hear it? And he said, no, because if I do that, you won't work as hard. So he's like, I don't want to hear it. I, I see it. I think you're going to do great. I know you are. You're not going to let us down. And I did the presentation. And he said, you did the work. You get the credit. And so I have learned to basically, when people say, you know, you take all the feedback for yourself, but you share all the praise. Yeah. He was that guy who That's really sweet. did that. And so people like to get shout outs and yeah. they like to get recognized because you can't pay them all the time. Right. But if they say, hey, Kimberly, I know you did a great job with that project. I really appreciate it. It's it true. does work. So, Kimberly, you know, the uh, diversity, which is a natural, obviously, you get that. Cause yes, <laughs> I do get that on every level, Tom. <laughs> on every level, I get it. Um, and I. The Deloitte Australia did a survey recently, which I love, and I've been uh, blogging about it. Oh, but it, really? they found that um, the companies that got diversity and inclusion right, mm -hmm. and that means it was part of their fabric, mm -hmm. right? Which I think, you know, back to this leadership and collaboration, if you're really, if you are a collaborative environment, then diversity won't be a big issue because you'll have everyone involved and they'll all be participating. Right. Anyhow, so they, that was kind of what the theme was. It, it, the companies that actually included everyone genuinely in doing the work, collaborative teams, right. all that. 800% increase wow. over those that did not. Wow. So just you know, speak to that. What's your perspective on that and what are you noticing or how's like Oracle thinking about those kind of things? Well, from my vantage point, I mean, diversity is very important because we are constantly, in my role, looking to develop and articulate new solutions. And so someone's advantage that they have is that they have their mother, they live in the South, they live in the North, they're Canadian, they live in the U.S., they, have, they live in London, we're working with them, um, they, they know four or five languages. And so when we bring all of that talent to bear, yep. we have an amazing solution that's not groupthink. Right. So I went to Loyola. So imagine if I only had Loyola grads from Baltimore right. in a room that had a Jesuit upbringing from middle school forward into a room and said, okay, let's brainstorm. Yep. You hit it right in the head. I would guarantee <laughs> that our thinking would be very similar yep. and we would not get the best level and scope of ideas that we could if we brought in someone else, because they could come in, and I would always say it's like Superman, right. come in with x-ray vision and say, oh, you forgot this. Yep. And we, oh, we did. <laughs> we did forget that. And so I think for me, having grown up in the inner city of Baltimore, I think it is very important to have diversity and to have different genders and geographies yeah. and people, e even where people fit in their families. I know yeah. that's strange. The oldest child, the middle child, right. the youngest child. Just right. diversity. Sometimes we only think of diversity in terms of gender or in race, right. but it's diversity just based on that you're different. I love it. That's You're, you're so spot on. I mean, that it, I'll never forget. Um, and, and we've had that as an initiative, but more importantly, we've just reached out to everyone, which is what I love about yes. our association. And we have access to so many people, whether it's you know from Western Maryland to the Eastern Shore, or oh, I love it. down in the city, or Urban or rural. to your point, age and all, you know yes. all diversity, not just race and gender, which we all tend to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and the notion of truly inclusiveness, which is come to the table and help us figure this out. Exactly. That's the magic, right? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, just say, hey. What do you think? What do you think? If this was your problem, what would you do? And as leaders, 
sometimes I maybe just pose the question. Yeah. Guys, yeah. this came on my desk today. I don't know what we should do. I'm, I'm debating between two different options. Which one would you do? You, you know, it's funny. Uh, four most important words in business, what do you think? I mean, if we all could, as leaders, ask that question more Absolutely. and organize more ways where we could have our teams do that, that would be a, a huge piece of that, right? I think you're right. That's, that's cool. Um, so the other thing I'm thinking about is, you know, you're, you're kind of a younger generation, mm -hmm. tech savvy. You're in the tech sector at one of the highest tech companies there is. But what would you advise to people who are maybe not so tech savvy and maybe older? We have some of our Gen Xers and Boomers who didn't grow up with technology, aren't in the tech sector. Where, where, would you, where should they start or what should they be thinking about? Is there any advice well, for them? Absolutely. They should start with BLI. We have a lot of great oh, classes. Oh, thanks. I like yeah, that. Absolutely. <laughs> so we have a lot of great um, sessions and workshops. We have a conference. I mean, we in the Maryland Association of CPAs will help them. And so they should not be nervous because a lot of this is in the magazines. It's online. We also have classes. Their kids could help them and teach them. They I just have that. to have the willingness to learn it. It's about So you hit two key points just right then. Um, Reverse mentoring, right? Mm -hmm. is so it, whether it's your kids, and I have a lot of ton from my kids. I've got a, a herd of little millennials, but um, but also in your work, right? We, yes. we we joke about, but we have a few millennials around here, and whenever we have some issues, we're like, let's go check some. Of the, it isn't always age related, exactly. so it's not just millennials. But the point is, anyone who's tech savvy, go have them help you with the tech thing. If it's something else, absolutely. So so seek help as a leader. Don't be. Um, don't be so cocky that you can't ask for help. I think that's a key point. And, and go to the younger troops who have that direct experience maybe with the mobile phones and tablets and, and stuff that you might not have. Um, one other thing, you talked about this, you're, you're a, a kind of voracious reader and scanner. You pull that together, stay on top of this stuff. What, any tips for like filter? How do you filter? Because all of our members are saying, Information overload is a really big issue. How do you manage? I mean, you're looking at globalization, all these. Uh, what's your, any secrets, any tips? Well, a lot of these companies have Twitter accounts, and they can only tweet 140 characters. <laughs> or is it 140 characters? Yeah, 140 characters. So, so it's very small. So you can get news headings. You can get on, um, I have BBC News. I have CNN News. But I'm getting the breaking news. Yep. So I am getting the headlines of all of these major So you're scanning magazines, those big scanning headlines. Just, Twitter is one of your tools exactly, for that. Absolutely. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So you can go and just kind of scan. And you can narrow your search to the topics that matter to you. Because there are some things that are going to matter to you, and then other things are just not going to be on your radar. Right. The other thing you could do, and this is what I would always challenge my team to do when I was a CIO, if I've read it, then that means that we can have a conversation. So let's come in and have a brown bag and let's talk about this topic Love today. It. And so the challenge would be everyone would have a topic because we could learn from each other. So your topic yes. is, you know, it could be cloud technologies and how do we secure the cloud or how do we do on-prem to cloud integration. Yep. And so getting someone on a team to present to the rest of us and you buy lunch, you bring everybody in and we have different topics that we discuss. Love it. So so, so distribute the learning with Absolutely. your team, right? The whole a power of collaboration again. So if you're scanning that piece, right. I'm scanning this piece, we get together and we can have a, have a conversation. And about you that. can send out interesting news. We get people who will send out news articles and say, hey, did you see this? Yep. So send it to your team and you can yeah. send it to your clients, so right? That's the other part is oh, what about that, sending that great. out to your clients? Yes. And say, hey, I just read this article and I thought about you. Yes. What, wouldn't that be powerful, right? Did you right? see this? Did you see this, right? You could be helping to scan on behalf of your clients. Absolutely. Because they probably can't read it all either. Right. Everyone's struggling with that. So Everyone's we always love that help. Um, you know, we just started a book club here at the MACPA and our team is on fire because they read a couple chapters. We give them 15 minutes a day to, on their own to read it. And then. Yes. Once a week, they've been getting together, and the ideas coming out of the group has been unbelievable. Which, Isn't it? I'm in a book club. We're doing a book that I've read, but I love it. You want to tell us what it the is? The Tipping Point. Ah, I love I it. Malcolm love Gladwell. It. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to read his whole series. But I think that is what they need to realize, that, you know, there's always a tipping point. You know, you're working, you're working, you're working along, and there's like, boom. It's, all of a sudden, it's like everywhere. It's pervasive. It's in our yeah. DNA. And you're like, what happened? <laughs> what catalyst? 
was what made this. So it starts with those little steps. So you have to start somewhere. Yes. So, all right, so you gave some good tips on, on Twitter and obviously, so books, Kindle, is that what you're using? Yes, you I'm using a Kindle, Kindle because that way I can take it with me wherever yep. I go. And I will say, I love to read. And initially, it was a little hard for me yeah. to give up my books. I love the physical book. Yep, same And line. to go to a Kindle, but I'll tell you, I lost my Kindle. And then my books were all in the cloud. You're right. And it was wonderful. I was sold after that. I'm totally sold. But I do like the physical books. Yeah. Um, and I sometimes do both. But I do, I mean, I love my Kindle. And now, do you ever take notes or highlights and stuff yes, on your Kindle? Yes, I do. That's the other thing I think we need to tell, tell people is people don't understand how far that's come along. But your notes are all online. Yeah. So you can copy and paste if you want to put them in a presentation, like a great quote from an author. Yes, and right? in most presentations today, you're quoting someone. Absolutely, there's right. Some, there's some quote that you want to tell everyone about. Yeah. So, yes, you especially in the, the Malcolm Gladwell series. Yes. Yes. So any other favorite business books? That would be kind of cool. Is there anything, any other recommendations? Well, I have all of the so traditional Gladwell, books. All of the point. all of the traditional books we're reading. I mean, we're gonna do good to great because I'm in a volunteer based organization for my sorority, right. and so we have different disciplines. And of course, I tell them that being a CPA is the best always. I love it. And so when they meet me and they say, "Well, you're you're kind of well rounded to be a CPA," I said, "Well, that's because you don't realize that CPAs are really providing the fabric of our strategic advice. Yep. Uh, most of these companies, you have." CPAs CPAs, and they did not realize that we were so pervasive. Yep. Just because someone's not in public practice right. does not mean that they're not actively working to here, the profession here. and learning every day. Yep. And so most of the business books are the ones that, for instance, we're in my MBA program. So I'm going back because we have people who are in education and social workers and, and case workers who did not have the same background. Um, and we've had a lot of different great authors yep. crossing the chasm. Yep. You know, Jeffrey Moore, yes. you're, you're all my so, favorites. So we go back and get those same ones. Love I it. mean, so if I, and I've already read them, so I can lead the book club. Because uh, when you're leading the book club, right. you have to, you, know what's going <laughs> you on. have to read the book at least, or at least be a chapter ahead. Love it. So that's why I'm cheating a little bit, but I'm reading my own. That's books. okay. All right, so our newest one we're reading in our book club is Flash Foresight by Daniel Burris, who. Oh, Daniel Burris, so I love him. We're working with him on some other yes. stuff, but that's a really cool. Oh, that one. So anyhow, though, you got Jim Collins, Good to Great, yes. Built to Last, the, the yes. Crossing the Chasm with Jeffrey Moore, there, you know. Malcolm yes. Gladwell, Simon Sinek, that's another one I'd say, right? Start with why. There's another couple of good ones. And you had a ones. really good book you had us read on the board, um, Dynamic Leadership and Growth or something. Uh, what was that? Uh, well, the one that we also had recently, Rita McGrath and the End of Competitive Advantage. That's another oh, really good one. Oh, I need to read that one, Tom. Rita okay. was, a, was a great, I'd like came to here to Maryland and spoke. Um, so, yeah, any other tips for anyone else? Anyone else, anything else you can think I about? I think that you just have to be flexible and be willing to learn, and be patient with yourself. I and mean, if you're not familiar with this, you didn't grow up with it, I didn't grow up with it. Right. So just think how quickly we all can catch up. And I think it's something, we're CPAs, we can do it. I love it. Absolutely.